you can put the talent up there and yourself make a film that's so empty and immoral for each and every day. I find very offensive and condescending about your statement is nobody would say to a bunch of white filmmakers, how could you do this to your people? Yeah. My name is Emily Pinto and this is Take Two. The previous clip was taken at the Sundance premiere of Justin Lin's debut feature, Better Luck Tomorrow, about an ensemble of overachieving Asian Americans in Orange County who venture into a life of petty crime and gang activity. The film was produced by then cultural zenith MTV and in contention for major awards at major festivals. Regardless, it is now mostly forgotten. It did, however, provide many Asian Americans the opportunity for bigger careers. Lin is now a big blockbuster director, most notably directing entries in the groundbreakingly diverse Fast and Furious franchise. Some of the actors have also made it. Sung Kang became a fan favorite in the aforementioned series and leveraged it into mainstream recognition, while John Cho appears in everything from raunchy sex comedies, big blockbusters, underspoken indies, all of which also pioneer discussion and representation. Better Luck Tomorrow subverted expectations of Asian identity 15 years ago in 2003, but not much has changed since. Many depictions of Asian Americans in Western media still dangerously essentialize the experience. Think about the last time you saw an Asian face in a mainstream movie that wasn't crazy rich Asians. In American movies, Asian characters make good filler characters. They can be really good at math and science, or they can be experienced in kung fu. They can be desexualized, one-dimensional, bland, comedic relief. They're rarely afforded the same semblance of normality or development that white characters are. It's fine for some characters in a movie to be less defined as others. They're bad white characters all the time. But with representation already so rare, effortless characterization becomes dangerous. Culture writers often applaud the progress made within representation, citing the diversity of modern casts as proof that Asians are gaining a foothold in a white-dominant Hollywood. There has been an improvement, this much is true, but it is more sinisterly grounded than it seems. This novel flux in Asian bodies is not conceived out of a respect of Asian culture, but rather out of corporate greed for a piece of China's financial pie. In Transformers, Age of Extinction, an entire final act takes place on the streets of Hong Kong, where Chinese stars command a disproportionately low amount of screen time and everyone knows kung fu. Though the movie was not too successful domestically, making only $245 million, it was a huge hit overseas, in which it made $858 million. Over a third of that final box office came from Chinese audiences. In Transformers 5, The Last Night, Autobots in the Midwest browse Chinese used car websites and almost everyone owns a late eco phone. In Captain America Civil War, the Avengers switch their phone brand from LG to Vivo. Neither Lay Eco nor Vivo are available in America, but Hollywood blockbusters care less about accurately portraying the world and more about appealing to Asian markets. The nature of films are even changed sometimes in alternate versions made for international audiences. Iron Man 3 had an American and a Chinese cut. In the latter, famous Chinese actors Fan Bingbing and Wang Shuichi are granted a good portion of screen time together, while in the former, their characters do not exist. A lot of these big blockbusters are co-produced with Chinese production companies. Were this not the case, would we still see as much progress in the name of representation? Even though white people hate to see Asians win, they'll happily pander to Asian audiences to exploit the growing foreign box offices. People are beginning to notice. Crazy Rich Asians was criticized for the wealth and sheer self-indulgence which the main characters display. These critics approached Crazy Rich Asians not as a work of cinema, but rather totally from a standpoint rooted in social concern. Film criticism is subjective, of course, but doesn't this kind of moralizing seem a bit microaggressive? To reiterate Roger Ebert in the opening clip, nobody would say to a group of white people, how could you do this to your people? In Hollywood, white is right. Even when films are not explicitly about money, many movies depicting white bodies often come with assumptions of wealth and class. Nobody bats an eye at these moments of window dressing, but the sheer concept of Asians being afforded the same plot devices of financial security is enough to convince people against a functional rom-com that does not deign to be much else more. White anxiety over Asian success has always counteracted natural progress. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act outright banned Chinese immigrants. 
Before that, Chinese laborers were forced into restaurant or laundry businesses because it kept them safe and out of the sights of anxious white men. By feminizing the Asian man, anxieties of future emasculation are assuaged. In Hollywood, the same anxieties manifest. This is most clearly recognizable in the outright erasure of Asians. The term whitewashing is thrown around a lot for good reason. Other problems arise even when Asians are given roles. Wage inequality is easier to explain. Producers assume that minority faces equate to less revenue. There are other more hidden results to this white narrative of Asian inferiority. Legendary silent film star Sesu Hayakawa grew a large following of white women. Look at how they portray him in movies. In Cecil B. DeMille's The Cheat, for example, he becomes a literal symbol of yellow peril. From the opening scene, he is shrouded in expressionist lighting that casts doubt on his socialite polite behavior. He loans a large sum of money to a white socialite. When she resists his advances, he refuses repayment and instead brands her body with a Japanese insignia. The movie becomes a rally against multiculturalism for the preservation of white masculinity. It's a reactionary tactic, utilized in the banishment of men of other minorities in the name of white supremacy. This repression of Asian sexuality generally transcends class boundaries. In Jean-Jacques Anneau's The Lover, a young middle-class French girl dominates a submissive Vietnamese playboy. This continues today, for the most part. In Romeo Must Die, history is changed as Jet Li's Romeo never gets to kiss Aaliyah's Juliet. In Hollywood, it is also common for all individual Asian cultures to be conflated into one, as if the dozens of more specific identities don't matter as well. Chinese women play Japanese comfort women in Rob Marshall's Oscar contender, Memoirs of a Geisha. Perhaps one day it will be normal to classify films about Asians on their own more specific terms. But that may require white people to learn the difference between Chinese, Korean, and Japanese faces. Positive advances are occurring in the midst of all the big name subterfuge. Some instances of representation are more significant than others, even if they make less of a mainstream impact. Asian and Asian American directors are creating their own opportunities in the independent film genre, with films such as Andrew Ahn's Spa Night, Justin Chan's Gook, and Yen Tan's 1985 touring film festivals, and bigger movies like Kogonada's Columbus and Anish Chaganti's Searching playing major theater chains. Two great documentaries this year were helmed by Asian directors such as Stephen S. Ming's Crime and Punishment and Patrick Wong's The Bread Factory. Stephen Yoon, after becoming a fan favorite for supporting on The Walking Dead, had a colorblind lead role in Mayhem and a great supporting turn in Sorry to Bother You. Live action Mulan even has an ensemble Asian cast. But even though Asian-Australian James Wan is directing Warner Brothers' tentpole Aquaman, and even though Aquaman looks like this, instead of this, Hollywood still has a long way to go before it can claim to respect Asian and Asian Americans' rich culture and complicated identity. My name is Emily Pinto, and this is Take Two. See you again next episode. Filmcourse.org's crash course on how to make a short film is the place to learn what you need to know to turn your idea into a movie. From pre-production to production, and finally the post-production, the course will teach you screenwriting, producing, directing, editing, and so much more. Sign up for a free preview now at filmcourse.org.